welcome to your summer uh, nature journal session. Um, we'll give, as we give people a few more minutes to show up, um, we, I will, um, we will introduce ourselves so I, you can start. <laughs> yeah, so hi everyone, if this is your first time coming, uh, my name is Billy Jo Reed. Um, I live up in Ontario, Canada and I work um, as an outdoor educator and uh, yeah, I will be co-hosting with the Bea while Jack is away this summer. So thanks everybody for coming. And my name is Ivea Moore. I live in San Francisco, California, um, sometimes co-host for Jack in different venues. Um, and I'm very excited to be working with Billy Joe this summer and, um, and hopefully, hopefully making Jack proud. We miss him so much. Um, so we're really, really happy to see everybody today for, for our first session of our Nature Journal um, Educators Forum in the summer. Uh, so what we are going to do today um, is Avea and I thought we would come up with a sort of a kickoff to summer, uh, sort of get us minds on thinking about summer. Um, because we are such a small group today, we're all just going to stay together. Um, but what we wanted to start off doing is talking about what are some of our favorite summer activities um, that we'd like to do journaling and then we can kind of brainstorm that. And then what we'd like to do is kind of go into what are some of the safety things that we need to sort of think about and consider uh, when nature journaling in summer. All right. So uh, maybe I'll go first just to get us kicked off. Um, so some of the things that I really like to do is insects are really exciting for me uh, in the summertime. So I really, really like to sort of, um, especially with my students, um, we use Oh, I should have brought them today. Um, you can cut off the top of a two liter pop bottle and then you can use like a yogurt lid. And what you can do is make like little bug catchers. And so the kids can kind of use like a double whammy to catch the little critters. Um, and then they can keep them in there for a little bit of time and we can sort of journal them, look at them. And then voila, we let them go and it's sort of miraculous. So that's one of the things that um, I really love doing. Um, and then I have to tell you like sunsets are where it's at for me. So anytime that I am camping, you will always catch me on the beach uh, for sunsets at all costs. Um, so this year, I think my goal, my goal is gonna try is not only just to take pictures of them, but I am going to try to journal them this year. So that's gonna be my um, thing with maybe pencil crayons or even venture into the world of watercolor. So those are some of the things that uh, I wanted to mention to get us started. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand. Um, if there's anything that you like uh, to do, and I'd love to brainstorm some fun ideas and then we can have them all to take away with us. Yeah, Rebecca, go for it. I'll bring you into the spotlight. Um, oh, here's go. the first thing that came to my mind is any thing to do with water in the summertime. I have like, especially um, getting on my rain boots or my water shoes and walking in a creek and just being able to like explore that part of the place that I don't usually get to really go in and just going like exploring up and down the creek, looking under rocks, looking for macroinvertebrates. I haven't really nature journaled this yet, but that's the first thing that came to my mind is something I love to do in the summer. Uh, macro invertebrates, we do a program at work called biodiversity. And so we made sort of like a mock template um, for the kids to sort of journal it. And then we gave them some prompting questions like, does it have wings? What do you think it is? A carnivore, an omnivore, um, a herbivore? You know, what life stage do you think that it's in? You know, what are some of the things that you're wondering? So we sort of like created these little templates for when they're looking at those macro invertebrates, which is pretty cool. So I love that. Those are my one of my favorite things to look at too. Anybody else have any ideas about what they are liking to do in the summertime? Yeah, Kate, we'll bring you into the spotlight. And then I think we have to allow you to unmute. Oh, yeah. I can oh, we did. Yay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one really cool thing at Lake Pacific Northwest is we have a bunch of edible berries, um, just wild berries. And so you kind of get to add another element of um, like sensory interface with nature. I mean, that was one of the things that got me really into going out and being in nature as a kid was eating things, um, amazingly more things that I should be eating than not. So good job on that front. But um, 
yeah, I think it's a really fun way to interact with things and it can get especially kids really excited about going out and learning to ID plants because it's a really good incentive if you get a treat for it. Your talk about sensory, oh, sorry, Rebecca. Oh, um, I just wanted to add one thing to Kate. It's just that like, um, not only do we get a treat, I think because when you do things like forage for wild plants or something or build shelters or something that's tied to our survival, it becomes such a stronger memory than just like, oh, I'm just interested in it for the aesthetic or because it's, I'm just interested in it. Like it's, it just becomes that much stronger that then like the next year you come and see it and you're like, oh, that's the plant that I eat because your brain is like, I need this information to survive. So I'm going to put like an important highlight on it. Um, so that's, well, I think like things that have to do with foraging, catching, searching for things that we actually use can be really powerful. That's what I wanted to say. Oh yeah, like I know my brain goes crazy with like the mushroom hunting thing because there's some, it's definitely a hunting thing. Um, but yeah, it's kind of funny. Like we'll get the first rains in fall and I will start dreaming about chanterelles. Like it's time, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much cool stuff to learn there. I mean, like to go back to the book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, I talk about foraging tied to like creating that mindfulness of the connection with the land and the species and that sort of exchange and knowing how to mindfully forage is really important. That's something that, especially if you're in a position to be an educator, something that you should really emphasize you're going to teach people how to harvest from wild places is how to do it with respect and to foster like positive growth in that natural community instead of just taking exactly I was going to add um when you mentioned the berries then you talked about sensory and that reminds me as well um I think them in general I like like it can be fun to do sound maps but specifically summer sound maps and it could be fun to do that and do one each season or make that intention to do one each season. So that, that way you can see how the sounds differ from each other. Is summer louder than winter? Um, are there different animals that you might hear? Or do you hear more birds in one season and insects in another? Or just things like that, or the sound of water. It could be really fun to do um, summertime, summertime sound maps. Um, oh yeah, sound maps on the days of the solstice and equinoxes. I love that. I love that idea, Rebecca. Um, and then, and then in general, um, and then you know, smell maps. So sensory maps in general might be really fun to do, and with kids. Um, I'm trying to think about some of the other things that I know that kids really love about the summertime. And I like what Rebecca had mentioned in the chat about mud and playing and getting dirty. Um, you could even do mud paintings. Um, speaking of journaling, you could do oh. mud paintings where you see the different colors of mud based off of where you are. Maybe the soil up beneath a certain tree has a certain look on it, or maybe you could do sap on one of them to see how the saps look, um, or maybe the mud by the riverbank looks different from the mud in the backyard. Um, so that's just another idea. Yeah, and speaking of sensory, I think also just to emphasize that sense of touch is also really important. Like I remember in the International Nature Journaling Week group last year, there was like a discussion in the comments about like, is it okay or not okay to touch things in nature? And a lot of people were saying like, I thought it wasn't okay to touch things. I thought I wasn't supposed to. And like, yes, to an extent, we wanna teach leave no trace and respecting nature, but we need to touch things at least somewhat, both to have a connection to it and for our own sensory integration and mental well-being. And yes, there are some things that are not good to touch, like don't touch poison ivy, don't touch things that will hurt you. But if you learn, but I think it's really important for everyone, especially kids to learn that, yes, there are some things that can hurt you if you touch them, but that is a much smaller amount than all the things that are okay to interact with. And if you learn those specific few things, then you can just know to avoid them and that you can touch things in nature. And as long as you're not hurting it, like if it's there's a really delicate rare wildflower, you probably wanna leave that alone. But to know that 
yeah, just in general, you can touch things and then you can write that in your nature journal. What was the texture? What did it feel like? Like Ivea was saying, you can play in the mud, you can use the mud to paint or sap or all these other, there's so many possibilities and um, we need to not, we need to know that those are possibilities and not be closed off to them. So just kind of going off of what Kate was saying, even about mushroom hunting, um, I have a friend who does spore prints. So goes out and does, gathers mushrooms and then does spore prints. And this is the first time this last year that I'd ever heard of that. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then making your own um, inks and things like that. I always come back to Roseanne, right? Like Roseanne, I just feel like is like a master at making her own inks. Um, but even sometimes I've taken just the berry and just like smushed it like in the book. And then like once it dries, like to be able to explain like what we thought or try to color match it before and then see what that juice, when it dries, what that contrasting color is. Cause sometimes they look purple, but they actually dry blue or, you know, something like that, which is really cool. Um, so I just wanted to add those, those two things in there too, which I thought I think are really cool. I also saw this thing, um, uh, oh, so I, I started the Canadian uh, Nature Journaling Club just so we could try and get some people to come in and around Canada that, that know each other a little bit better. But there was this woman, um, she nature journaled birds, but she didn't draw a single bird. And the cool thing was, is that she wrote down the names of all the birds that she saw. And then she did like a color palette like beside it of the colors that the birds were, but then didn't actually draw it. And I was like, that's awesome. Because imagine like the kids who get really nervous, like I can't draw the bird, you know, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, somebody who's just like, ah, I don't really love, you know, the drawing part of it, but I really like the words and the color part of it. So she had like a, like a, uh, a red winged blackbird. It was like black. And then there was like a, a red and then it had like a hint of yellow. And so you go through, but she did it for trees. She did it for birds. She did it for all these amazing things. And I thought that was a really neat way of sort of doing something a little bit different, but really focusing it on color, which I thought was really cool. So that was a neat thing. I love that idea. What I was kind of thinking with the stuff that I wanted to do was less about like teaching people how to draw and teaching people how to like get themselves to draw. Um, and so I love that idea because I think if you can get people to where there's putting down a bunch of marks, eventually like they'll start trusting themselves a little bit more to start making things. And I could see that as like such a great introduction to like even the activity that I want to do tomorrow, which is either a photo or video slideshow of like various birds from this one ecosystem or birds and animals go, if you're not comfortable drawing something or you don't think that that's something you want to do, maybe try this or this or this instead. So that like, you're still, cause my whole thing is like, I fill up journals, I draw things like in repetition where I try to like improve by just doing like tons and tons of pencil miles. And I think that that is a really intimidating part because if you're gonna, and people are their own worst critics with art. And so it's really hard to just go like, oh, I'm gonna draw a bunch of things that I'm really bad at drawing and it makes me uncomfortable because I, you know, I'm bad at it and I hate it. You know, that's how I'm with drawing people and I still keep avoiding it. I haven't done the whole, pencil miles thing that I've done with literally everything else. So we'll see one day. Um, but yeah, try and get people like, no matter what you're doing, if you're putting marks on that paper, then I think something's still happening with that like brain body interface and yeah. Yeah. Like you're still noticing, right. And it's almost mm -hmm. like you're creating like a rainbow of what you're seeing outside. So I think that you could even interpret that in so many different ways. Like maybe they, that's what they do is they create a rainbow. What bird did I see first? What bird yeah. did I see second, right? And this different sort of creative out of the box thinking, but now you have this plethora of color and especially in summer, like mm -hmm. we get really excited in Canada because it's like everything's pretty white and brown for like a lot of the year. And now yeah. all of a sudden like everything's really colorful. I think Rebecca, you're similar. You're just south of me, I think, right? Yeah, probably so, not like, quite as much, but it's yeah. still is winter for a long time here. Yeah, like forever, right? And now we finally, you know, have these amazing colors. So even if you were doing a garden study, 
you know, you yeah. don't really have to necessarily Anything where you just like splashing colors on there. And I yeah. think that's a great, like sensory thing because yeah. people, I mean, who doesn't love to play with their watercolor palette? Right. Know? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got Lynn. Excellent. Um, yeah. Has anyone tried using stickers? I've got to teach a class on butterflies with kids and adults. And I was thinking of, I've taught art before, but not nature journaling. So I was thinking if I had some kind of stickers that, that they could put in their, their journal and then also draw the butterfly or the insect. Has anyone tried that before? No, but I love stickers. Okay, if I do, I'll tell you how it goes. <laughs> I, used to I think stick. I think that's the beautiful part is that there's no rules, right? So <laughs> I mean, give it a whirl, right? Go, Avia. Sorry about okay. that. Oh no worries. Um, I used to teach um, preschoolers gardening, and so we would try to do a little tie-in activity each time. And one of the things is. I would give them these empty Play-Doh containers that I would kind of stab with holes in the bottom to make a little um, planter. And so I'd give them these really, really big thick stickers of butterflies and, and bugs and let, them, and let them decorate the sides of it, which I thought they really, really enjoyed. Um, like so yeah, stickers. Well, maybe for totally decorating the top of your nature journal, either like a, a homemade one or one that you buy. Yeah, oh. I love cover my own stickers and drawings. Or maybe just letting them like incorporate the stickers into their pages oh. wherever they want to. Like I might, I'm thinking of some of the notebooks I had as a really little kid. Like I'd write things down, I'd draw pictures, and then I'd just put stickers all over it for no reason in particular. And that would it would it just makes it really fun and it could connect it to ways that they're already used to engaging with paper and all these materials. What's okay. the age demographic that you're teaching? Pardon? Oh, what's the age demographic you're teaching? Um, yeah. Well, it's probably going to be adults and then children too. But if they're under 12, they have to bring, you know, an adult with them. So I've right. done this. I've done this before. It's for, um, you know, conservation groups. I'll go in and teach something. And you never know who's going to come in or who they'll bring. So I always try to think of something so all different age groups. The kids are easy. You just point them and go. <laughs> it's usually yeah. the adults that, yeah. that'll say, I can't draw, you know, so if I have something else for them, if they put stickers in, they can draw the sticker. If I have specimens there, some that usually the kids just want to draw the specimens. They don't care about, you know, being handheld or anything. They'll, they'll go right for it. A couple of ideas um, building on that. For one, um, stickers can also be a fun way of, of sort of like, you know how the other week at International Nature Journaling Week, oh, it's good to see you, Mary. Um, the other week at International Nature Journaling Week, Jack was showing about how you can just take some paint and just paint on the random pages so then that way the pages aren't blank. You can do a similar thing with stickers. And I've had friends give me, one friend gave me a cookbook, um, or I should say a blank notebook that she said was going to be my cookbook. And so she would put random recipes and random stickers and random doodles on random pages so that I'd just be doodling, I'd just be going along blank page, blank page, suddenly there's the one with the caterpillar on it and I'm, oh, how cute. And so that could be kind of a fun thing for people to do in their nature journals. And another idea is, I, I don't see people doing this very much, but also stencils. Stencils can be fun too. Yeah. People outline it and then they kind of fill in the design. And then it also, it, before they can freehand, it also sort of trains your hand about how to make certain shapes too. So stencils might also be, um, an idea. Right. That's a good idea. Yeah, Lenny. What are some other fun things that people, either either things that you yourself do or things that you do with your kids in the summer or things that you did as a kid in the summer? Um, what are some what are some other ideas that people have? I think I'm really liking these. I feel like there could be a lot more play with the water as well. Go ahead, Rebecca, and then Kate. Um, yeah, and then Kate next. Um, well, one thing that I really like to do in the summertime here in the East that I think of that I associate with summer is like having campfires and just like telling stories around the campfire. I know that this is not safe to do anymore in a lot of places, um, but for where it is, first of all, you can talk about like the different kinds of wood that you need to gather up that can lead into 
where does this wood come from? What are the different kind of trees? What kind of trees are best for the fire and why? And like, how do they grow? And like learning about the trees. Um, but I think that just like this idea of having, like getting in a circle around the campfire and telling some campfire stories is um, that can be really like kind of similar to like share, like let's all gather together and sharing our nature journal pages, like in a way that feels really special or just telling our stories out loud, either just like, hey, we all went out and observed some things, like let's share the story of what we, you know, of our adventures and what we found. Um, so that's something that you can do, you know, even if there is or isn't an actual fire there, you can still like gather up and have that like, let's tell stories around that campfire kind of experience. Um, like Ivia, yeah, you remember I taught a workshop, we're writing workshop Wednesday on this theme last year and how to like make up, oh, hang on a second, just a second. Um, we have to like make up our own story, like kind of mythical, like legendary kind of stories about like, how did the nature in our place get to be the way it is? Um, and you came up with an amazing story about like the serpent of the serpentine cliffs. So that was a lot of fun. But so you could do, you could be as imaginative or as real as you want. But I think just having that, cause it feels, it just, there's something different about like, oh, let's gather around the campfire that feels a lot more special than like, hey, let's just group up in a circle. And like, we're all here together as a community and sharing these things. Absolutely. I love that, especially the togetherness part of it. Um, I know a lot of people see summertime as the time when you go out and have adventures together, that it's a time to really celebrate, whether it's that you're going on that family field trip or whether you're going to to scout camp and, and or any sort of summer camp, then it's it's a time of gathering a great deal too. We don't think about it necessarily that way because we think of gathering as belonging to holidays, but summertime is that as well and I love how stories will bring the community together that way thank you Rebecca and and then Kate you were raising your hand yeah I was gonna say summer is a good time for tide pooling and that's another great sensory activity because I mean I don't know about you but I have my hands in there sometimes more than my hands in the water I mean there's so much stuff in there and a lot of those animals are so hardy that it's like a touch tank put there by nature and so as long as you're like supervising things like sea hares, I know some sea hares do not care at all if you pick them up, as long as you hold them under the water and pet them gently. Um, I mean, there's so much cool stuff there and teaching people how to like, I think the coolest part of that is looking for like wonderful, amazing things in areas that you might otherwise pass over. Absolutely. Yeah, and, go. I was like, we were kindred. I was just thinking that. So go, what were you, where'd you put the chat? Oh, so, so, okay. First I was thinking about, about how it's definitely like the perfect time for low tide. Um, or, or, sorry, right around here, it's low time. So it's perfect time for tide pooling. I mean to say, so it's good to look at that. And then it reminded me of an adventure I had um, last year with some friends where we went tide pooling at night because we're crazy. And one of the things that really struck us was looking up and seeing the stars all over and seeing the moon as the moon, the, watching the moon tilt so that the moon has its terminator line directly straight. And then as it goes towards the ocean, it begins to tilt is really, really fun seeing over the course of an evening. And because I live in the city, I don't get to see star, uh, as many stars as most people. So the reason why the Big Dipper is my favorite const or asterism, not really constellation, constellation is because it's one of the only ones I actually see. <laughs> um, but out there at that night, we could see so much. And I, I was just going, I mean, I could have just stared at the stars all night because you never get to see them. Um, and so it can be fun to do that um, on a summer night because then it's not nearly as cold at nighttime. So you get to be out there together um, looking at stars. When I was so, yeah. canoe tripping, we used to take, I used to print off like star charts that like the brown ones that switch with the times um, and take clients out into the middle of the lake at night when you were far away from the edge of the forest and you just had a bigger sky to be able to see. And because you're out on canoe trip, you're way far away from any city light. So it's just this miraculous sky. Um, and then if you put a red light on your flashlight, you can still see 
um, the star chart, but it doesn't affect your night vision. Um, and then we just sat out in the boats and like just picked out all the different constellations. It's also a really, a really great way to learn the, the constellations as well. But that by far was was one of my favorite things that I that I did was um, was to do that. And now nature journaling, I would be like, then go back and now add them into your nature journal, which would be really cool. And tying constellations into storytelling, you can not only learn the constellations and learn the stories behind them, but then you can also make up a few of your own um, if if it inspires you to do so. Um, especially if you have learned a constellation is looking a certain way, but you live in a place where you can't see all of the stars as the constellation, then you can make up a new story using the stars you can see um, as an idea. Um, and yeah, yeah, like Rebecca saying, learning different constellations from different cultures too. That that's a really fun way to share stories and. Also continuing our, th our theme of International Nature Journaling Week, um, just learning the rich cultures all over the world and all of the different ways that we see the world in those. I love that. Does anybody, I wanna make sure, does anybody else have any ideas? Anyone we haven't called on yet? Um, I see Eleni just turned on her camera again. So hi, Eleni. Um, and so does anybody else have any ideas? But I wanna, yeah, make sure. Before Kate. I just got one more thing. So in relation to the tide pooling, the whole story about going out in the middle of the lake, um, if you have the opportunity to either go on a dock or somewhere where you can put a big light there, in summer you see a lot of like zooplankton weird stuff, little baby fish that will come up to check out that bright light shining down to the water. Uh, I briefly lived on Galliano Island up in British Columbia and um, there was this great little like nature museum thing that was on a floating dock and there's this little shed it was in it was really cool anyways what they do is they pull a panel out on the floor and they'd shine these lights down everyone would gather around and look down at like all these creatures down there and it was so cool and i feel like that'd be something that would be really easy to facilitate um and be a really cool opportunity to do stuff. It's kind of like a campfire. You get like this blue thing of like, what will come up from the deep to see our lights, you know? I love that. I, I didn't, um, I didn't even think about that, about using the light to attract the zooplankton. And now I want to really find a way to try that. It's and so then it, Or even just bioluminescence. You can go on dock at night and, you know, throwing handfuls of sand because it's very like benign ecologically and it creates a pretty good little uh, light show. With sand, that's cool. Yeah, just go on the beach and grab some sand or pebble, pebbles and stick it in a little bucket and then, yeah. I'm also seeing that Billy, Joe, Lynn and I suddenly thought of the exact same idea at once. So Lynn, go ahead. I wanna hear what, um, what you were gonna say. Yeah, you those got... were great ideas. I just turned the lights on. I get so many moths here at night and sit out on the deck and I've been trying to sketch them. They're a little easier than the butterflies. They don't move as fast. You can kind of put them on your hand. But uh, yeah, I, I never thought of a sheet, but I think that's a great idea. They'll go up against the sheet with a light behind it. And what? National Moth Week. Oh, I gotta check that one out. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Rebecca. There was, there was an event recently that had happened somewhere close to here. Um, there's some gardens up in um, somewhere in the north, um, north coast. Um, and and they, they have this yearly moth night where they do, they take a white sheet and they take some blue lights and they put them beneath the white sheet. And then they, we, we go and we draw all of the insects that show up on them. I didn't get to go this year, but last year we even got a couple of sphinx moths to land on them, which was really cool. And then if you get there slightly early, you can see the flowers changing at dusk. One of the things that we saw was we, we stood by this entire bush full of evening primroses and they were all curled up. And I have a video somewhere, I can even put it up for fun, um, where we literally watched them pop open, not slowly either, pop one by one by one. And within about 45 minutes, we had 30 flowers all popped open on this bush right at dusk. We didn't actually get to see any of the of the um, of the moths feeding from them because I'm told that that moths in particular really, really love those. I think sphinx moths. Um, but it was cool enough just seeing them pop open like that. 
of like little popcorn, except that they were eating primrose. It was fun. And and then yeah, Billy Joe, you're saying the same thing. Have you also done that too, where you put a sheet up and then see who who lands on it? We do it at work. We um we get we take a white sheet out and then get the kiddos to go like in a meadow and get them to go out and around the meadow and then see kind of who jumps on it. But for biodiversity weeks and stuff like that, we get a lot of the people. So my husband works for the conservation authority, so the biologists they do it at night. They put up the big sheets and then you can go and you can sort of be a part of it. I haven't done it yet, but it's on my list of things to do is to go out at night because we get like luna moths and things like that here as well, which are quite big and they're like a bright green color. They're super pretty. I've only ever seen one in my whole life. So um, yeah, I just think it's so neat just to how can we like be in that environment, but attract them, but not in a way that's that's going to do any harm. I just think it's really beautiful. So that's awesome. Is there anybody else who had any other ideas? Oh, sorry, Abby, I totally cut you off. Oh, no, not at all. Zoom is hard because of like, we all start to talk, but then we're not all in the same room. And so yeah. people yeah, no worries. Um, I was going to say that also Rebecca had mentioned, and I've and I've remembered Rebecca talking about this before about the fireflies. So if you are lucky enough to live in the part of the country that has fireflies, enjoy them for all of us out here who don't have any, at least not ones that look like all glowy. So awesome. But yeah, but yeah, I wanted to. I agree with Billy Joe. We could ask him. Um, does anybody else have any? Yeah. Yeah, Kate, go for it. I've got one for if you have a big group of kids, it's a really fun game. Um, I forget what camp I was at exactly, but I remember loving this game as a kid. It's great if you need to wear the kids out and teach them something at the same time. Um, so it was a game where we talked about how animals function within the ecosystem. And uh, basically there was a couple different stations and each station have a person that would have a different colored marker and they have to run between these different stations and the stations would be food water shelter reproduction and you'd have to collect a mark from each one and they do a circle line and show you'd survive one year and then um the kids would go running around and they have to keep doing that but there'd also be predators in there and the predators like it was this whole complex like game ecosystem but we spent about half an hour running around like trying to collect all the circles and stuff or wait no so the predators if the predator catches you you lose a circle and then whoever like at the end of the allotted time has the most circles wins um yeah it was wild i just remember running and running and running and having so much fun but also like there's a great lesson to it about like this is what animals think about think about like these things that they need and they have to get those stuff without getting caught by predators and yeah so Kim was just saying um, that she now has some great ideas for um, trying out journaling with those that are reluctant to draw, which is great. That's awesome. Um, what do you think of it? Do you think we're ready to switch over to some health and safety stuff? I think that'd be yeah. a good idea. So what we wanted to do is talk about like, we've done it for winter before where we sort of looked at like, what are the things that we need to consider when we are out um, with our like ourselves but also with other people in terms of the health and safety so what do we need to be sort of considering and thinking about um especially um you know to make sure that everybody has a great day and depending on the heat and all that kind of thing so um let's talk about it because even though we're in different regions summer's summer's pretty hot in north america no matter where you really are so i think most of it will fly um between both spaces so Let's hook into that and give ourselves a super brain list of fun things that we can think about for making sure that everybody's time is enjoyable. So what are we thinking? Everybody got some ideas to get us started? Yeah, so Karen's saying hydration, sun protection, insect protection. So that's a great one for insect protection. So for me where I work, we are on a wetland. So the mosquitoes are like bonkers and they're bonkers right until like November. So we have them for a long period of time. Um, and so I don't wear DEET um, because it's a personal choice. Like it's a, it's a bit carcinogenic and stuff. So I use a bug jacket. Um, we have bug hats for the kids or um, a woman that I know who lives up in the North. Uh, she came up with this like total herbal uh, remedy that we sort of use as well. 
However, we are starting to see a lot more ticks um, in and around where my area is, and we're starting to see them migrate further north. Um, and so there's a lot of deer ticks, and so Lyme disease is on a bit of a rampage. Um, so we are having to go from wearing, you know, shorts and capris to long pants with our socks tucked in and high pants and or high high boots, things like that. Um, that we haven't really had to think about a lot. Um, so I'm not sure, like, what are other people doing for insect repellent? Because I always find it such a interesting one. I forget the name of it. This is Eleni, mm -hmm. but I, I get one that is safe for kids. Um, uh, I don't know what the ingredients is. I can run out in my car and get it in a second. But it's also uh, good for <laughs> humans of any age because, um, you know, some of the uh, folks that, that are along with us outside, you know, men who are bald will need to put it on their heads with hats and um, then it drips into their eyes. So it has to be something that is sort of safe if it gets in your eye, uh, it's, it doesn't hurt you. Um, I wish I could remember the name, but I'll, I'll, I'll find it. And also, I think, I don't know if you mentioned this, Billy Joe, but uh, light colored clothes. So white and khaki, because then the ticks will show up. Um, the ticks we have here in the East Coast in central New Jersey are big black uh, ticks, um, but sometimes they're very small and you can't see them. You know, like I would never wear something this color, it would just kind of blend in. Yeah, poison oak, poison ivy, we got all that too. I see Rebecca raising her hand too. Yeah, I've got some things to share on the ticks because I'm in Syracuse, New York, which is a little bit south of Billy Joe. So we've been dealing with the ticks for a long time now and Lyme disease is rampant here. My mom's had it three times. It's not fun, um, but it, it's a risk. It's a real risk, but there's things that you can do and you don't want to let it stop you from going outside. Like the elementary school here, when I was there, I used to do a field trip to the state park with the fourth graders at the end of the year. And I I don't know about now, but for at least a while, they, they don't even do the trip anymore because parents were worried about ticks, which is really a shame. But um, just a couple things, especially from my experience doing field work jobs, where we were getting data on the forest and the insects and different things and bushwhacking through all day long in tick heavy areas. Um, there's a couple things that we did, um, like using sprays and things, although honestly, I try to avoid them because I don't think that's really great for us either. Um, but one thing, if um, you have the resources for it, probably not everybody can, can get it, but insect shield clothing, it's like different um, shirts and pants that have the insect repellent kind of built into it. And that lasts for about 70 washes. They have all different designs. I've got a few shirts and pants that I wear a lot out in the summer. Um, that's really helpful. And then you don't have to worry about like spraying it yourself on all the time and getting it places. Um, other thing is like gaiters that go like they kind of hook around your boot or your shoe and you like wrap them around kind of like your shoe to ankle and that helps to basically just keep the ticks off. Um, you can look that up. And also what we used when we were going to be going out and bushwhacking through everything all the time is lint rollers every day when we were done before we went back inside we just take the lint roller go up and down all the way like up our pants and everything and we'd often come up with like covered in ticks um so it's a good way to just get them off before you you know take your clothes off and get them they could like get other places um and so that, yeah, you can get them off. Um, also just doing tick checks every day when you come in, just checking yourself, either like when you take a shower, when you get undressed, just checking, especially like all the little warm areas that ticks like to crawl into, um, especially if they're small. And another thing that I, just a tip from personal experience, if you're gonna do like, socks in your shoes and put your pants into your socks um make sure that 
the socks, you know, when they stretch, they don't have little tiny holes in the fabric because like that's how socks often are. And those that can often, I found that some ticks were small enough, they were still getting in through the socks. So just be aware of that. The other thing is knowing the symptoms of Lyme disease. Like I think, cause they used to say the tick had to be on for a really long time for you to act for it to actually transmit the disease, but we know that's not true. It, like you can be on for a pretty short amount of time. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it is. Is it, are they saying it's like, if it's on for a day or if it's like on for a few hours, but like you really wanna find them right away because they can get you sick. Um, and yeah, and that, that stays in your bloodstream for a long time. It can be really hard to remove, but if you do notice anything like, get to a doctor right away if you can. Um, you know, you can get on antibiotics like doxycycline to get, to try to get that out of your system. And then especially is knowing the, the bullseye as you guys, maybe you're familiar with, I know everybody here is, but if it's, if the spot where the tick was develops like a bullseye kind of like red and white, like, like circles, that is a, pretty clear indicator of Lyme disease. So you would definitely want to go to the doctor if that appears, but it doesn't always appear. So it's just a good thing to be aware of. That's very good. I didn't, I didn't actually know of that about the bullseye or else I didn't remember it from whenever I was taught. When you're, as a kid, I think I was taught about ticks maybe twice only. And it's one of those things that you have to know about each season that just in mm -hmm. case, just to be safe. I also noticed that both you and Eleni were mentioning possible um, possible repellents and which ones you all think are, might be safer or less safe. Do you two have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, here's the, the honest truth is when I was doing these kind of field jobs, like we were given beet and stuff to spray, you know, every day. And I often didn't use it because I just didn't want to, um, but that's what other people use. So we were kind of having some discussions of like, what are the long-term effects of using this every single day? Where do we don't really know? I'm, I don't know. I just, also then if, the other thing about it too, is like, I know when I was just walking around in the ecosystem, it's not, it doesn't just kill ticks. It's not selective, like anything that you, walk into it's going to kill and I don't want to just go around randomly killing all the other insects in the ecosystem who are supposed to be there so I mean ticks are supposed to be there too they're just uh kind of a nuisance to us but and it's they and they've been increasing because of the warmer weather um but um yeah there's been some like more natural kinds I I don't know, there's I had like varied success with that, but I don't honestly, most of the time, I don't really use it. I kind of feel like I'm supposed to, but I try to just be more careful about like, where am I walking? You know, try to stay out of the tall grass if I can, um, check everything after, use the insect shield. And sometimes I'll even like, just be aware as I'm going throughout the day, like just kind of like, hey, do I have any ticks? crawling on just sometimes I catch and I can catch it like oh you're trying to crawl on me don't do that and I can catch them before they bite onto me before they creep in under my clothes so um that's kind of what I do but I I know a lot of people would say that I should be using <laughs> some better kind of spray I don't use spray either I I haven't in I don't know 20 years yeah. I think also the thing is that I go outside so often and for me it's not as much as like oh I'm going outside for a few hours for like it's a special event I gotta get all geared up and put on my bug spray and everything and then then it's like it's on your hands or it's on your clothes or whatever I think it's like I just tend to like throughout the day or whenever I can I'm often just like outside and inside so I don't want to have to be like putting on a spray, then you have to come in, like take a shower, get it washed off. It's like a whole ordeal, which and, and depending if you're on how, going in outside a lot, it doesn't work out well for me. And depending on how strong yeah, the heat is, it will melt plastic as well. So when I was on canoe trip, 
a lot of the stuff that we had was plastic and uh, I watched sunglasses melt like off people's faces and things like that. So you have to be careful with the strength of the DEET as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Eleni, go, 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 go. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to help those that, uh, you know, I'm starting this uh, nature journaling club here locally and I've got some senior citizens and so not using DEET, I, that's what, I get that. Um, but we have a lot of mosquitoes. So going out, you know, going out and about and being mindful about ticks, I really appreciate that. And one can sort of take care of it. But mosquitoes, uh, if, you, if you get bitten and they get infected, you're the kind of person that gets infected. It's sort of, it's like you, you can't, you, you have to do something about it. Like I can't get my husband to go with me even outdoors unless there's something to get, you know, to address mosquitoes because they're, they're big monsters and they, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have them here as well. They, so they bite you, they get infected and then, you know, the guy won't leave the house. So uh, what we do, like, like I said before, I use, um, uh, a bug jacket so I, it's got a, a bug jacket yeah. yeah so it's got like a like a hood it's got a like a mesh sort of screen um, and then it's got mesh under the armpits as well and then it actually yeah. folds into its own little like hoodie pocket as well at the end so I use the one called um, the great blah, is it the great bug jacket or something like that you can probably get it I'm trying to think of the like REI places like that like uh -huh. the big big places it's a little bit more expensive but it's a nicer material the ones that are all mesh i find um they'll they'll rip relatively really like quite yeah. easily the other thing i find with mosquitoes is if you're wearing uh, light colored clothes like ticks um and then you wear baggy ones as well so as long as it's not like sort of form fitting like if you would like similar to what you're wearing right now like that kind of shirt is that like just you moving around like they can't really get in. So uh -huh. I find if you have like looser sort of fitting clothing and then, oh. you know, maybe you're sort of watching your face, but yeah, if you go out in shorts and a tank top and you have nothing on for protection, you're going to get annihilated. Right. So wear like a, an over shirt, like something that's really nice and lightweight. Um, yeah. And I think you can get clothing as well. Like I think Rebecca was mentioning it's like paraffin or something like that, that is like embedded into it. I think that's, yeah, what that's a good mentioning. idea. And the other thing too, I know is like, maybe you don't want DEET like on your skin, but if you right. do a citronella or you do something with a, a lighter, uh, less high percentage of DEET, I know some people that put it on the clothing. So like on a right. button shirt, they'll spray it on the clothing so that it's not necessarily on the skin. Um, a friend of mine used to wear like a, like a, like a bigger kind of scarf to sort of protect the neck. Um, and she would sort of spray it around here. Funny enough, bounce. If you put bounce in the back of your hat, um, that also works um, as oh. well. They don't really like the scent of bounce. That's very, so, very helpful. Yeah, we when we do our ropes course, we would be like, we'd have, because you have to have your hands uh, like ready to go. So you right. put bounce and you can't be smacking mosquitoes when you have somebody on belay. Um, so we've sort of found all these tricks over the years to sort of help with mosquitoes. Um, but those are some of the ones that, that we sort That's of- That's very use. helpful. Also Thank note you. your time of day as well so they will be worse like in the morning and in the evening yeah they will also be worse i find right before the rain comes yes so it's like they're like oh my gosh this could be my last meal and they will also <laughs> you know i find get a little bit thicker sort of in those times so if you're able to like you know pick trails or spaces that you're going to journal that you're a little bit more out in the open um they they don't really um they can't really handle breezes. So if you're oh. in a dense forest, they will be worse. Um, but if you're out in the open, that little breeze will generally keep them a little bit more at bay. Um, so those are things like for us at the field centers, the forest is a little bit more sort of out of bounds and sort of May, June, just because they're so thick. But if we're out in the meadow or we're out in sort of our open fields, they're a lot easier to be able to deal with. So those are just some that is so tricks. helpful. Thank Over you the very years. much. Yeah, yeah. you've given me some great ideas. Hopefully you can get your husband outside with you. <laughs> if I can get him out, I can get the rest of the senior citizen. I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> get the rest of us uh, out there. That's great. Thank awesome. you. Thank yeah, you. you're very, welcome. Very you're much. welcome. Very helpful. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots going on in the chat, Avea. What else do we have going on that people have put in there? 
Ooh, um, let me let me read the um, all of the all of the good ideas. So ideas about hazards in the summer. We have um, hydration. That's a huge one. Rebecca and Karen both said that one. Hydration and water, sun protection, insect protection, caution around reptiles, and also adding in there about being careful if you're if you're exploring around and you're reaching beneath the rocks or the logs. Karen points out that that might be where snakes are. Um, so to be mindful of that. Um, also, Kate mentions to be aware of wildfire smoke in your area, um, which would make outdoor plants difficult. And I want to add to that, to be mindful of when you have extreme uh, risk days or higher risk days when things get really, really dry and hot, because then the fire doesn't always get caused by something like lightning. Sometimes something else can cause the fire. I have this, I have this one memory of um, I used to help sort of manage a garden down in Santa Cruz and somebody had gifted us these solar powered um, little lanterns. So the idea that, you know, they take in the power and then at nighttime the lanterns would work. Well, one of the lanterns decided to combust itself during a one particularly hot day in May. And myself and a friend came in to find that part of the garden was on fire um, because it decided to combust. And so we put it out with the hose and then we took the other, um, the other, what is it called, lantern, and put it in the closet where it would never combust ever again. Um, but that was unexpected. We did not expect that, that was going to be the thing that caused it. And so it's not always necessarily a lightning strike or a fire, an actual campfire that will cause it. Sometimes there'll be other things. So to be mindful of that. Um, let's see here. And of course, the, the, the smoke that comes from that. Careful around amphibians if you're using bug spray. That's absolutely right, Rebecca, um, to be careful about those. Um, we, we briefly mentioned as well that um, poison plants, plants like poison oak and poison ivy, all of the lovely things from the Anacardiaceae family, yay, um, and, and the oils therein, um, especially because I've noticed, or at least I've observed that, that um, with the poison oak around here, it tends to be a lot shinier and, in my opinion, more concentrated in oils if it's growing in the sunlight, because the oils act a little bit like a sunscreen for it, whereas it can be a bit more matte um, in the shade. Not That doesn't mean that it's not as infectious in the shade, but in the sun, you're going to get a ton more oils um, with the poison oak. Um, so to be mindful of that, um, let's see here. Yeah, not sticking your hands under rocks. Um, what um, Billy Joe mentions weather, knowing the signs of thunder, lightning, and tornadoes. Um, certain weathers will be more extreme in the summertime. Um, let's see here, what else? Um, I'm not seeing, let's see here, am I missing anything? Oh yeah, um, good point E about glass and magnifying glasses in the sunlight. Um, in fact, I'm wondering if maybe that might have been part of what was on that particular lantern. I'm wondering if there might have been some kind of a magnifying device on it. Um, I'm not sure about poison ivy, um, just because I've never gotten to see it before, which is even more of a reason I need to go visit my friends over in on the East Coast so I can actually meet poison ivy for once. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. Um, but those are some things. Um, I'm not sure if summertime is already kind of past the pollen season, but if there's any last minute, you know, pollen still drifting around, be careful of your allergies. And of course, insect activity, make sure that you have your EpiPen if you're out there um, in case you get stung. Uh, so those are some others. Yeah. Oh yeah, I like that. Um, leaves with three, let it be. Don't be a dope, don't touch the hairy rope. <laughs> That's funny. Um, in with with um with poison oak, it's also leaves of three, let it be. If it's hairy, it's a berry. If it's shiny, watch your hiney. Uh is another one. Uh, so those are some. Are there any other um concerns that have come up for folks? And and also extra, extra emphasis on the water. Um, it's really, really easy to not think that we're dehydrated when we are. I don't know if anybody recently saw um, Marley's most recent video before he left for the um, Galapagos, but he had gone out into the desert and he got really kind of frightening on his video where he began to talk not so clearly. He began to seem a little bit out of it. And he thought that he might be have just mild heat exhaustion. Mild, he thought. Um, pretty clear to the rest of us that it was a lot more than mild and it was extremely alarming. And so you yourself may not be aware of how much you're being affected by it. So if possible, also it's good to check in with people when you're gonna be going out so that, that way, if you don't come back at a certain time, people will know to go out and look for you. 
Um, also, I think this is more spring than summer, but I know that around some of our local areas, we were getting signs up saying to not go to certain areas, like we couldn't go to Corona Heights for a while because of coyote pupping. So also to be aware of, um, of megafauna and some of the mammals who might want you to stay away from their young'uns. Um, some of us have seen the video of the one jogger who saw some mountain lion kitties and was all kind of like, oh, hey, look at those. And then the mom came and backed him up the trail about five miles. Um, so be mindful not to approach the babies. Um, ooh, and, I, and, and Rebecca's um, bringing up a really good thing here about um, close supervision versus letting kids explore. Did you want to um, talk a bit more about that, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. I just um, came to mind, this is a topic that can be pretty controversial and might be good to discuss a little bit here is, you know, um, it's like, well, I didn't even really experience this, but like in my parents' generation and past generation, it's like, you know, kids are told just like go outside and play and they didn't have a cell phone. They went and just explored in the woods or the neighborhoods and, and came back for dinner. And whereas for my generation, things were a lot more like stranger danger, don't get out of your parents' sight. And these days, like either parents or educators can get in really big trouble if they're not supervising their kids directly. So it's like, we wanna be safe and we don't wanna get into like, you know, legal issues or anything, but kids also still need to have some experience of being able to explore for themselves and have at least the feeling that like, they're not being, you know, super closely watched by the adults with their every move, you know? So yeah, that just could be a topic for discussion, um, maybe even another time, but yeah, like how do you guys find that balance? I think that's a really good question and I'd probably have to think on it some. I think it also will depend on the kid um, and the kid's sense of safety. For example, if I'm out with, with um, a couple of times I've gotten to hang out with the adventure girls and seeing how the adventure girls approach their surroundings versus how my own son does is really different because they've been training for so long to climb the trees and to be masters of op over, around, down and through, or I can't remember all of the, but, but they are a lot more experienced in that. And that's another thing too, is that you might have kids with different levels of experience, mm -hmm. whereas Logan would probably be interested in climbing a tree, but he's never climbed one before. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of it is teaching like healthy risk management and like what do you feel like acknowledging there's always some risk, but how does each kid learn, you know, like what's what's an acceptable risk and what's not and how do they spread their comfort zones, but in a way that's not gonna, they're not gonna get really hurt. Absolutely. Um, and what were you gonna say, Kate? Oh, I was gonna say that. Um... Well, actually, a big part of it's like the kids' level of literacy with how to engage with outdoor surroundings. And I know that a lot of kids who are raised inside who haven't had a chance to like explore on their own, they don't understand that like risk assessment side of it. Like I was really lucky. I got to tutor a group of five girls who did a lot of outdoor programs and they were super like outdoor literate. And so we'd go on hikes and stuff, and I'd find an area where, you know there was stuff to climb on, things to look at. And I just tell them like, okay, if you can see me, we're good. You know, you can see me, I can see you. And then um, I just did a really loud whistle and they all come running out of the woods and like, off we go to our next spot. Um, but like with those kids, I didn't worry so much because like, okay, I know that they're not going to do anything stupid. They're not going to, they know like how to behave in the woods. They know what stuff like not to do to get themselves injured. Um, yeah, either teaching that outdoor literacy. It's so hard though when it's not your kids. Like I don't have any kids, but I end up working with other people's kids a lot. And um, having that line of like, do I have enough of a relationship with a parent where they're gonna realize that like, if their kid falls and scrapes their knee, that like, that's a thing that happens and you know they're playing outside they're learning their own limits or are they going to like blow up at you for not protecting their precious baby so yeah I mean I was raised outdoors my sister and I like it's funny like even now I think our mom like is more protective of us now than she was then because 
we live in the middle of nowhere as long as it's daylight it's like oh where's the kids out there in the underbrush somewhere you know <laughs> whereas now if I don't text her back in 15 minutes she thinks I'm dead <laughs> so yeah you brought up a good point that I've just thought about too um <clears throat> for the kids who might not have outdoor literacy it might not just be them their parents might not either yeah that's maybe a big they're, one maybe they're parents, yeah, people would, they're like oh you go out in the woods by yourself I'm like yes or even like when if you see my instagram there's a picture of me sitting next to an alligator and people were freaking out I'm like okay i felt safe doing that because i know how to read animals and this thing was small enough i'm like okay i'm not worried about this thing dragging me into the water i understand that like this animal is calm it's looked at me it's accessed me it's like okay you're not food you're not a danger we can sit here together and like i totally like assess that situation and like assess my risks and it's the same thing with like working with horses too because it's like they're big they're serious like yes but there's ways that you can like be in that environment or situation and there's just things that you do that make something that might seem scary manageable yeah perceived an actual risk yeah that's very really true said that's one thing that we learned in school um, is to understand the difference between a perceived risk and an actual risk. So our job at the field centers is to make sure that we're mitigating all the actual risk, right? So I am uh, somebody who does let the kids explore off trail, um, but I know the forest well enough to know the spaces that I think are okay for them to do that. So in terms of, I make sure that there is not um, any species at risk in that area. You know, we've kind of coordinated off some spaces that, you know, maybe are a little bit more open, maybe it's in a pine forest, you know, things like that, that there's a little bit more space. Um, and then we talk about it before they go out there, like learning how to walk in the woods, like you have to watch your eyes. So sometimes I'll take them off trail first and be like, watch the people behind you. You have to put your hands up. Don't just let the stick whack back. You know, like there's all these different things that, you know, you kind of have to do, but I'm also a big advocate for letting them explore. But depending on the kiddos that we're with, sometimes that's a bigger space and sometimes that's a smaller space. And so sometimes it's, this is your parameter of where you can explore. And sometimes, you know, this is your parameter. Sometimes depending on the kiddos, maybe it's just along the edges, right? So we really have to think there's more than just the health and safety of the kiddos, but there's the health and safety of the environment as well, right? And so in one of our sites that we have, like we have the Jefferson salamander, which is an endangered species. So that's not something necessarily like we are exploring around the ponds in the springtime because they're, you know, laying eggs and, you know, all those kinds of things. So you really have to know the space that you're in. Um, and obviously now with the, you know, us seeing way more ticks, these are things that we need to think about as well. And we need to be educated so that we can have these conversations with the kids because the worst thing would be for them to say, my parents aren't going to let me come because they're afraid I'm going to get ticks. And so just sort of being mindful. And so, you know, as a leader, I do think that um, you should have first aid so that you know the signs and symptoms of your heat, your signs and symptoms of, you know, for us on the East Coast in the winter time, you know, hypothermia, dehydration, what are the, the things that we're looking for? If you've got some elderly people on your, on your trip, like, you know, what are some other ailments? Do they have aspirin with them? Are they diabetic? Like there's all these other things that we need to consider that in the heat can be sort of ramped up to extra levels. Um, so yeah, so salty snacks, sugary snacks, because with diabetics, it's always good to make sure that you have sugar tablets, right? Um, and depending on how far you're going, you might have to be thinking about water purification, because if you're going on a hike all day, that you're gonna be nature journaling out on a 10K hike, you're not gonna take like five liters of water with you. So if you know that there's streams and creeks, like you need to think about how you're gonna purify your water. Is there enough for everybody? Do Am I using a pump? Am I using tablets? Like all these different things that we need to sort of consider to make sure that everybody is um, really safe. Um, and so some of that comes from my canoe tripping background and some of that just comes from being at the field centers with all the kids too. 
And one last thing I wanted to point out is that culturally we have to remember as well, because where I work, there is a ton of kiddos who are just moved to Canada or their first generation. And they are coming from countries where it is very scary to go in the forest because there's lions and tigers and you know dangerous venomous snakes and venomous spiders and it is not the place that you're able to go and so you know it's easy sometimes for us to be like no we don't have those here you know what are you talking about ha 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 and you're like well no we have to remember that's a ha 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 because that's a that that's where they come from and that's a real concern so i actually love when the parents come on the the trip because then not only do i get to give the kiddo the information but i get to give the parent the information and make them a little bit more comfortable that you know where we are yes we have one venomous snake in ontario but knowing where those pockets are that it lives and you know southern ontario we don't have a lot of bears and being able to have those conversations that your local parks and conservation areas are a fantastic place and very safe for you to go. But here are a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. So, I would I would I want to add on to what you'd said too about water and when you're out for a long time. Um, I think that's also a good thing to, if you're having a program where people are coming and they're expected to bring their own water bottles, emphasize that. But then also have a few spares in case somebody didn't bring one, because that's the worst thing for them to not have. <clears throat> if you're out there, you're going out there and then somebody collapses, no. So have extras. Um, and also that's a good point about how for some folks that the risk might be higher where they where they come from about going out in the woods. And also there are still risks in the woods where we are too, even if they're not, maybe they're not as high as in some places, but they're still there. Um, and so it's good to be aware of that. And one other thing about bugs. I notice in all my years canoe tripping and even with kiddos who have first moved to Canada, if they're coming from a country that doesn't see a lot of mosquitoes, they will swell with a mosquito bite that for me, like I don't even swell anymore. I feel like I've just been bitten by so many mosquitoes over the years. Whereas um, Europeans, like I've had some clients from Germany, places like that, they will swell like they've been punched in the face kind of thing. So just be really mindful that depending on sort of where you're coming from and if your body has been exposed to the, you know, anticoagulant that the mosquitoes are using, different people will react quite differently to those. Um, and so just to be sort of mindful and not to like freak out, but that is a, a thing that I have noticed over the years. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, yeah, just when Ide was saying like, you don't want somebody to, you know, fall over or faint or whatever, um, just some, reminded me of something when I worked at summer camp um, last summer, something that, um, you know, they said to us is like, have a map if you're going like hiking out on trails like have a map with you know your trails and if there were a situation where like you needed to call an ambulance for whatever reason like know because they can't drive into the trails know like what directions that you would give them that would they could go on the trails to get to you the most quickly um and yeah if you don't have cell reception like have walkie talkies or something like that's another thing as a camp counselor like we had our, we each had a walkie talkie that we could talk to other counselors that were within range or talk to the um the camp director um a last thing i wanted to say is that a thing that's come up a couple times today is this idea that like kids might not have like outdoor literacy nature awareness and their parents might not either because they wouldn't get it from their parents you know if the parents have it the kids are more likely to have it but that's just why programs with families or that include the parents and the kids together can be really powerful and really important um, because otherwise the kids come to a program, they learn some new things, they can be that way for a little while, but if it's not supported when they go home, then they'll probably just forget it or lose it or, you know, the connection to the parent is so much more powerful than to any other educator, you know, so if we tell them like, hey, it's okay, you don't have to be afraid of these things, you know, you can do things this other way, but then if they go back home and are told the opposite or are just not supported in that, then they'll probably just lose it. So having programs where it's the whole family learning together and kind of 
yeah, getting just getting to reinforce all of the things that they're learning can be really powerful. Yeah, I saw something about like the fear of spiders and snakes not being like an innate response. It's something that if you show a spider or snake to a child who hasn't been exposed before, they won't react negatively unless they see that from their parents. So yeah, there's so much unconscious learning that happens. One thing I want to suggest is because because I'm really liking this topic of um, perceived versus actual risk, I want to propose that we bring this up as an entire session at some point where we talk about that with regards to the outdoors in general. Um, and we can talk about what what ones might there be in, in each category. And then also if the those two things vary based off of whether a person's a beginner or whether they've had a little bit more background knowledge. So I want to I want to ask that we come back and revisit that at some point um, soon in a, in a session. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'm going to go. Thank you, guys. This was great today. Wonderful to see you, Rebecca. What do you think, Billy Joe? Are we pretty good for today? Um, should, we, yeah. should we close out? Yeah, I was just going to say, thanks, everybody, so much. That was awesome. I've got two pages of notes, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. So thanks, everybody, for coming today and, and uh, giving thanks, us all guys. your wisdom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This was great. Amazing. We'll see you all next week. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. You will. Thank you, Billy Joe. Thanks, Avea. Yay! <laughs> First time. <laughs> okay. I'll come with you summer, soon. By the end of the summer, we're going to take over the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm joking. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, Have everybody. a great time. See ya. <laughs>